This is the third part of today's session on memory. After we've talked about working memory as a concept and the model by Baddeley and Hitch, we will now talk about how working memory can be measured. So if you remember, one important feature of work working memory is that it has a limited capacity. And the best way to measure working memory capacity is the so-called change detection task that was initially used by Phillips in 1974 and then popularized by Luck and Vogel in 1997. So the change detection task measures visual working memory and in this task stimuli are presented long enough to be encoded into working memory. So you can see that um, in this display there's a number of items presented to participants. This is the so-called memory display. And then after these stimuli are presented and encoded into working memory, after participants had the chance to encode as many of them into working memory, a retention interval follows during which there's nothing on the screen. And then there's a probe display. The probe display is basically to probe working memory, namely how well are the items stored in memory. And the idea here is the better working memory, the more likely a change can be detected. So I want to uh, show this to you as a demonstration. Again, a task you can do now yourself. So the task is look at the fixation cross there will be a number of items presented, squares, colored squares, and you are to you are supposed to remember them. Um, so first, these items will be shown. They will disappear for a short period of time, and then they will reappear with or without a cha change. And your task is to say whether one of the uh, squares has changed or not. Okay, let's start. Okay, so now the question is, was there a change or not? Well, there was actually a change at this position. Let's try this again. Okay, was there a change or not? Actually, this time there was no change. And let's do it again. Okay, was there a change or not? Well, there was actually a change. So, this location. And one last example. Again, there was a change at this location this time. So, as you probably noticed, the more items there are on the screen, the more difficult it is, of course, because working memory has a limited capacity, so you can only put that many items in a slot in working memory, and if the item that happens to be probed eventually does not, um, did not fall into one of these slots, then you are at chance level. You can only guess if there was a change or not. If the item that is probably eventually was stored, however, in working memory, you'll be able to, to tell if there was a change. And this is exactly what Luck and Vogel found. So in this graph here, you can see on the x-axis the set size, so how many items um, participants had to remember, and on the y-axis the percent correct. And what you can see is that whether there's one, two or three items doesn't really matter, the performance stays um, at around 100%, and then there's some drop from 3 to 4, and then further down to, f to 8 and 12, quite a severe drop. So what does this indicate? It indicates that there is a limited working memory capacity as stated in by Baddeley and Hitch, and it does seem to be, um, this working memory capacity seems to be on average around 3 to 4 items, because that's when the drop in performance starts. By the way, participants um, also did this task with a verbal load in uh, mind, so they had to 
um, keep two digits in mind and, and basically use the auditory phonological loop to, to do that. And that was done to make sure that participants are actually using their visual working memory here, so that they are actually using a visual impression there, um, rather than just verbalizing the uh, colors. Um, and the verbal load didn't affect the results, as you can see. So the purple line here, or the pink line, is with load, and the black line is without load, and you can see the same pattern in both conditions. Um, so in the change detection task you can also use so-called conjunctions. So that means that items have two features, for example the orientation and color. So for example this one has a specific orientation and is black, this one has a different orientation and is red. So the question is now, how are these items stored in working memory? Is there a slot for an entire item or is there a slot for individual features? If it was for individual features, you would need eight slots to store this, namely for these four orientations and for these four colors. If it was individual objects that could be stored with all their features, then you would only need four. This is illustrated here. Each feature is stored separately. That means blue is, for example, stored here. So this is a person with a um, capacity of four. Green is stored here, and this orientation is stored here. Alternatively, if each object is stored separately, then you could store them like this. So what did Luck and Vogel found? Well, they found that um, you can store conjunctions, entire objects, in working memory rather than individual features. So it doesn't matter whether you have to remember both features of an item or just one feature of an item. Your performance is mostly just affected by how many items there are on the screen, not by how many features. And this even works if you use more conjunctions, like here. There's additional conjunctions like gap, where the gap is on the item, the size, small or large, the orientation, color. And uh, again, if you remember the conjunction, the performance is pretty much similar. You see the same decline in performance. And even with four features, there's no impairment in performance again like this. So this strongly suggests that the items are stored in working memory's integrated objects and not the individual features. So this speaks in favor of a slot model. So as a measure of working memory capacity, k is oftentimes used and k just indicates how many items you can store. So the assumption is if working memory has a slot that can be filled and the set size is n and your capacity is k, then n, um, then k out of these n objects can be stored. As a neural measure of working memory capacity, the contralateral delay activity in the EEG signal and the eventuated potential, or ERP, um, has been predominant in the last decade or longer. Um, the N2PC is, if you remember, a contralateral negativity to targets, and the CDA is similarly calculated, but it has a longer latency. So the CDA as a lateralized component also needs to be measured in a lateralized version of the change detection task. So to make the task lateralized, what, uh, in this version of the change detection task, what participants do is they only attend one hemifield indicated by the arrow here. So if this arrow points to the left, then only these items, in this case, these uh, items on the left hemi in the left hemifield need to be remembered. These will never be probed and can be entirely ignored. And then there can be a change here 
only in the left hemi field. As you can see, this one is a change trial because pink turned to black. So, in a way, this is very similar to the change detection task that I t um, showed you in the previous slides. Um, but the difference here is that we can now look at the lateralized EEG signal. So we can compare electrodes contralateral to the memorized side and compare that to um, electrodes and the ipsilateral hem hemisphere um, compared to the memorized items. And what you then see is a clear difference between the contralateral and ipsilateral sides. So um, the contralateral hemisphere is more negative compared to the ipsilateral uh, hemisphere. So as you can see, this is a rather long component. You can see this negativity. So negativity, because the contralateral side is more negative than the ipsilateral side, this negativity lasts up until the probe display is shown. So throughout the entire retention interval, you have this negativity, and this negativity is reflecting um, the working memory maintenance, or maintenance of these items in working memory. So what can we do with the CDA component? Well, first of all, it is interesting to see that the CDA component increases with the number of items stored in working memory. So for example, if there's only one item, there's only a small negativity, the pink line here. If you have two items, it's already increasing. And then for three items, red here, it's a relatively large amplitude. For four, interestingly, as you can see, there's only a slight increase, if any, at all. And this is quite interesting because if you remember there was also this behavioral change from three to four items when there was a um, performance drop when you had to remember four compared to three items. And this can also this relationship between the behavioral results and the CDA can also be seen here. So if you increase the number of items to be remembered, then the amplitude of the CDA increases and increases, and then asymptotes and stays around at the same level for more items. And the idea here is once your working memory slots has, have been filled up and there's no space anymore, then the CDA can't increase. So the CDA really reflects how many items are stored in working memory and because you cannot store more than three or four items normally, most subjects, then the CDA amplitude cannot increase anymore either. This is also shown in this strong correlation between the uh, between K as a measure of working memory capacity and the CDA. So those participants with a very high working memory capacity also have a larger CDA increase from two to four items. So far we've talked about enhancement in working memory, so how relevant information is more strongly represented and um, the visual system tries to maintain relevant information in working memory. But just like for attention, suppression also plays an important role in working memory. This has been tested in this revised change detection task um, by myself and Ed Vogel. And in this task, um, you don't only have, do not only have uh, relevant items, squares, but you also have distractors, the circles here. And similar to the idea of the N2PC and PD, we used a systematic lateralization approach, meaning that here the targets are presented laterally and the distractors, the circles, are presented on the vertical midline. There's also these gray placeholders for physical balance because uh, the EEG signal can be very sensitive to any um, asymmetries in the visual field, so we use them just to make the um, display more balanced. But the important items here are really the colored ones, so the targets on the left and the circles on the vertical midline. So these, tasks, uh, these trials can be used to measure the CDA that you already know. 
but we also had trials in which we switched the roles and now the distractors are presented laterally and the targets are presented on the vertical midline. And if you remember from last session, similar to the idea of the N to PC and PD, we can now look at the PD component um, and this would indicate us how much suppression of these items is applied to keep them out of working memory. So here are the conditions that we've used. Um, we had two or four distractors. As you can see here are four distractors, here are two distractors, and either the targets or the distractors were lateral. So these are the uh, trials in which um, the targets were presented laterally, and as you can see, there's an N to uh, sorry, there's a CDA. So the squares were uh, represented in working memory, and there's no difference between the set size, which is maybe not surprising because the set size does not reflect the number of targets. Usually, the CDA is affected by the number of targets, but here the set size refers to the number of distractors. And since these are the trials in which the uh, targets were presented laterally, the number of distractors should not affect the CDA. These are the trials in which the distractors were presented laterally, so this is where we can measure the PD or how much suppression is applied. And as you can see, there is a PD in both cases. This is the same data shown as a, a bar plot makes it a bit easier to see. So you can see that there is a PD in both cases, but the PD is larger for four distractors than for two distractors, suggesting that if you try to remember all the relevant rectangles or squares here, um, then if there's more distractors, you need to apply more suppression to be successful and to complete the task uh, correctly. And this is also reflected in this correlation. So you can see that um, this is the um, the PD is on the x-axis, the PD amplitude is on the x-axis. On the y-axis, you can see the working memory capacity of an individual. So for example, this individual here has a relatively low working memory capacity and also shows relatively low PD amplitude, so relatively low um, PD uh, PD amplitude reflects relatively low suppression. This participant, however, here um, has a very large PD, so a lot of suppression, and that participant also has a, a high working memory capacity, K. So this really suggests that the suppression, the, sufficient, the successful and efficient suppression of a distractor contributes to working memory performance. Another question is how um, items are stored in working memory. So far you've seen some evidence that there, that items are stored in terms of slots, so entire uh, objects with all their features. But there's still an ongoing debate where the working memory capacity is really better represented as these discrete entities, slots, or more of a resource. So this is indicated here. Um, this would be the slot model, so three items are represented and they're well represented. It's kind of an all or nothing. Either it is represented or it is not represented. Whereas the um, resource models would claim that you could also represent all the items but, on, but not with a very high fidelity or that there is some information loss but there is some information about all items. So. Um, some evidence for the resource model, for example, would be that when items change drastically, so for example, in the change detection task, if an item changes from red to blue, then performance can be extremely good and can be better if it's then compared, for example, for a change from red to dark orange or something like that, that is closer to the original item. So such drastic changes can actually increase the estimated working memory 
uh, capacity and this can for example be explained by the items being represented vaguely. So if you only have a vague representation of an item then a drastic change could still be detected whereas um, a more subtle change may not be detected. There's however also some evidence against resources in four slot models. For example, when items are queued, so when you give participants some kind of information where um, ind indicating that um, a specific item is more likely going to be probed e in the end, then there is no difference between neutral and invalid trials. So that means if you um, offer participants no queue or an incorrect queue, then there is no difference in the performance. And resource models would predict that there is a medium performance for neutral and bad performance for invalid trials. Because in slot models it's all or nothing, whereas in resource models that would be there could also be something in between. Okay, so much about measuring working memory. And with this part we will conclude working memory or short-term memory. And then in the last part we will talk about long-term memory.